On behalf of the family and also on behalf of the Reformed Presbyterian Church here in Dermara, we give you a welcome to this special service of thanksgiving for the life of our dear departed sister in the Lord, Mrs. Vera Gibson. I'm sure the family are deeply touched and overwhelmed by the huge number that are in attendance this afternoon, and that is a great tribute to the life and witness of Vera and the influence that she has had over all of our lives. Just uh, regarding the, obviously, a large number that are here, we're, uh, we're grateful everybody's come in safely, and obviously we ask if you're uh, moving out afterwards to the uh, graveyard also, you'll come safely, and, and the car park as well. Uh, after the service in the graveyard, um, the, there is refreshment, so you're very warmly invited back into the church building to share your sympathies with the family and to share in refreshments have been provided. Uh, the access to the upstairs hall is the stairs on that side. That other side's up to the kitchen, so if you come up this side, the stairs are steep. And so if you have patients coming up, there's a passenger lift in the corner, and some of our uh, folk here will help you uh, use the passenger lift. You don't want to use the stairs. Uh, but also, uh, some refreshments will be served downstairs in the back room as well. So if you don't want to go up the stairs and join that queue, there will be some refreshments served downstairs. At the close of the service, I ask the congregation to remain standing then just as I lead the family outside to the graveyard. This is a day in which we all are met together deeply shocked and deeply saddened at the suddenness of Vera's passing. We know from our own church family here and congregations who so recently at public worship as she was regularly. And she was at our church events and uh, with her family and with her sisters. They seem to be so much part of our church events and outings. And only a matter of a few weeks ago she enjoyed day trip with us on our church outing to Belfast and on to Larne and other places. She was steadfastly part of her own life and congregation here for over 50 years since her marriage to her late husband, Edward. But before her marriage, we know that she was involved in the life and work of the congregation of First Dremore. And as a girl, she was there in the girls' brigade and then with the family ever increasing, she, they moved from Lurgenban to the farm in Dromiller, uh, walking to Skeg School, and along with her nine brothers and sisters enjoyed the happiness of country life, which meant, of course, hard work, hard work at home, hard work, uh, and yet tender care one for the other, a great training for life, and even in times off school, as she went to Bally Vic McKelly School and Deboer High School, there were those seasons of the year when you had to do your part for the home economy in uh, uh, gathering potatoes, whether you had to walk several miles to do that. And as uh, Joan said, you came home at the end of the week with only 10 shillings, and such perhaps was child labor in those days. But we know that she rejoiced in being part of a large family, and that, in a sense, is something perhaps we don't experience so much nowadays, but it instills special gifts and special abilities into those who are part of such families. And her family so closely joined together and continue to be close, and we thank God for that and their representation here today. She enjoyed so much of community life along with family members playing the local band, and that was certainly attributed to her love for music, which she continued to enjoy uh, right up to the present time. Uh, but we know that she was one who shared so much friendship and love with friends and neighbors, ever caring, ever thoughtful, and asking about the life and needs of others. And also that would have been evident in her many years of work at Warner's factory, uh, where she worked right through until her retirement. It was there that she met Eddie. And in moving to the farm on Moybrick, the home place, 
uh, unusually Gibson, marrying Gibson, which I'm sure caused some comments in the country at the time. But there, coming into a home where his elderly parents were, and, and all the work of the farm was there to be done, uh, along with her own work, and supporting Eddie, and then a growing family of Andre and Mark. And lovely it was for her to have Andre and the family, and then uh, Mark and his family returning home from England to be with her, particularly after the loss of their dear father. But Vera did seem to be at everything. She was so much part in the life and work of the congregation here. Uh, she was so much part of her own community when we think of her work uh, and interest in the Women's Institute and also the ladies' meeting. She served in the committee of her own Women's Fellowship. Uh, she enjoyed being out with her family, visiting her sisters, being out with them. Always on the road, we saw her. She loved driving. And if I was out in the garden or out walking, she'd go up and pass. There always was a toot and a wave, but she seemed to be whizzing past to some destination to lift somebody. But she was so good in, in taking part in caring for the grandchildren, and especially when Connie and Zach came back home again. But in the life of the church... She was that shining witness for her Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Always a, an attentive ear and open heart. Always a shining face in her pew in that corner. I always loved to see her and loved to visit her in her home. Ready to do anything that she was asked. Her gifts were many. She was wise and thoughtful on the committee of the Women's Fellowship. And in her catering, her gifts uh, were very especially appreciated as the boot opened and some beautiful cream sponge appeared. And uh, we thought, well, the, the little pieces of fruit or strawberry in the top, we fooled ourselves to say, well, that's the healthy part. But we enjoyed the cream sponge and maybe a second or piece or a third piece. We really appreciated her work and witness among us. But she did have a heart for our congregation. And along with her husband, Eddie, they were so faithful at public worship. And it interests in things of the wider church as well. We, we know they were attending, they attended missions and meetings in other places where possible, and they enjoyed the fellowship of God's people. But they were always at events in the church. They took an interest in the life and work of the church. They were ready to help. They were generous with their gifts. And Eddie was, was so generous, particularly when we uh, were renovating the church building here. He was here, and Vera also. We were also shocked at the suddenness of Eddie's passing just over five years ago. But it was evident that Vera, while drawing strength from her family and friends, she continually testified to me that she got great strength from her living faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. She bore testimony to that living faith on so many occasions. Clearly, she was one who had committed herself to the Lord Jesus Christ. I know that she had done so personally in the ministry of one of my predecessors. When all those things that she knew to be true in her home and her home church, she affirmed by professing faith in Christ Jesus. And even speaking to her as she'd been at a recent uh, mission in her own district, she again knew that joy of the gospel message, the joy of knowing Jesus. And she was certain and assured that she had committed her life to the Lord. Isn't it wonderful to have that assurance, to have that hope, to have that peace that is not of ourselves, but it's all of grace, it's all of Christ, and he is the one who makes himself manifest in our lives. She loved the Lord, but we know that she really loved her family. Always concerned about them, doing what she could for them, and being loved so much by them. I know that on behalf of us all here, we do express our deepest and prayerful sympathies to you all. To Andrea and to Gary, to Shannon and Cain, to Mark and Jenny, to Connie and Zach, and to our brothers and sisters, Madge and John and Norman and Victor and Joan and Frida and Colin, 
thinking of them and their families, and also the families of the late Roy and Ruby. We have been praying that God would bring his blessing upon you, that he would pour out his goodness into your hearts at this time of deep sorrow, that you would know the strength and comfort of the Lord. But we do thank God for Vera, a sister in Christ, a true friend, and a true friend in the Lord Jesus. Let us come together to worship God. In Psalm 46 and verse 10, there are tremendous words that we have in this psalm. Precious words on the lips of a believer. Be still and know that I am God. We're praying that we may stop. We may be still from our striving and that we may consider the works of God, the person of God, and all that he has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We turn in our order service to Psalm number 23, these psalms chosen by the family. Familiar psalm to us. One sometimes we sing so often, we do not stop and be still and consider its nature. A psalm of the flock of God's people. Good shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who's laid his life down for his sheep. But we are the ones who experience that blessing as we know him, as we have answered his call to us. We shall not want anything. We shall not lack anything as we call upon him. And he calls us at times in life to stop, to be still, to see the good things that are around us, the green pastures, the quiet waters, to cherish those special moments. This is a day, a funeral service when we remember death, but it's a day of thanksgiving when we remember the life of our dear sister Vera. And there are so many times when she showed us that kindness, that love, Stop and think. Stop and think of how she was shaped in her life, how she was transformed in knowing Christ, and how she was so steadfast and faithful. Good things come to us from the Lord. He is the one that restores us. He is the one who gives the oil of joy for mourning. There is restoration in Christ. We look forward to that. He brings us in the pathway through this weary world. He brings us through the valley of the shadow. And we remember that that shadow is a cross-shaped shadow that protects us from that full rigor of death, the wrath of God as we come under the Lord Jesus. He brings us through. He gives us good things in the presence of many things that would rob us of our hope and our light. And we look forward to that day of entering in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we turn to this familiar psalm, let us think on these words as we stand and sing it, and then remain standing for prayer. Let us stand and sing.
Join together in prayer, let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that we come to you, our great God, our great creator, the one who is the great good shepherd of the flock and has demonstrated this to us through the life, through the work, through the wonderful call of your son, that good shepherd who is both the shepherd and is the one who is the sheepfold, the one who is the door of the sheepfold, the one through whom we go in and go out to a place of blessing, and the one also who has laid down his life for his sheep. Lord, there are so many wonderful pictures for us and reasons for us to hope in this psalm that is set in Scripture. But we thank you that these words are precious to us when we understand that we have access to you, our Heavenly Father, through your precious Son. As we come, we are not worthy of being your sheep. We are not worthy of being under the shadow of your wing. We are not worthy of having a table spread before us, having our heads anointed with blessing, or even entering into your banqueting house. But all these things have been done through the Lord Jesus Christ. And for this we praise you. But we do come with humble hearts, seeking the forgiveness of our sins, seeking cleansing and renewal, seeking to be still in our own hearts, that we would look up and we would see Jesus, not only seated at your right hand, but the one who has fully sufficed that price to be paid, that we can come to you and be with you and hope in you forever. Lord, we thank you for how you've been a blessing to home and family in these days. But we pray that you would bear them in this time of sorrow and grief, that they would know your blessing upon them and all who are gathered, that you would strengthen us, you would encourage us, you would be a blessing to us as we find comfort in your holy word. For we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to read two portions of scripture. Firstly, as we think of the nature of hope and death, and we think also in the nature of life and its blessings. Firstly, we read what I've already quoted from Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raised, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then reading in God's word from Philippians chapter 1. We think of the blessings of life for which we give thanks to God. Paul writing to the Philippian Christians in kind remembrance of them. Yes, is encouraging them, but is thanking God for his remembrance of their life, their works, and their testimony. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy 
For your fellowship in the gospel is from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness. How greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. And we thank God for the reading of his word. Isn't that that sentiment that is in our hearts gathered here this, on this afternoon? We thank God on every remembrance of Vera. When we are met together in this service, it is a funeral service, as we understand it, coming here in the presence and the reality of death. And it is right that we consider it, but not without the hope that is offered to us in Christ, that God has done something about death and its reality, knowing its intrusion into this creation. But life is precious, and we are met to give thanks to God on every remembrance of this precious life that has gone from our presence but continues in the presence of the Lord, sharing in the glorification of Christ. In our thoughts, of course, is the life of ones whose service here has come to an end. And perhaps at this time also your, your thoughts are also in remembrance of others. Because a service such as this brings others to your mind. Perhaps in recent days, or no less sorrowful as the years have passed. But how do we consider the preciousness of lives that are given to us? Well, we remember, especially this afternoon, one whose life, as Paul thought of the Philippian Christians, one whose life abounded in love, and you experienced her abounding love daily, her continual thoughts for her family, the little things and the big things that she did for you all, the things that are unseen and perhaps unknown until the days ahead. One whose works are approved as excellent and the large congregation bears testimony to that, but also whose actions were filled with the fruits of righteousness to the praise and glory of God. We are bore that clear testimony of faith to the work of grace in her life. And that grace is not just to make us better people or more patient people or more loving people. It is that we may inherit the full blessings that God has for us through the forgiveness of sins and in the reality of life everlasting. We are testified to the help that she experienced from her Savior. In times of joy for which she was thankful, the blessings of her family, the blessings of her late husband, but also how God had helped her through times. Times of sorrows after Eddie's passing. Times of sorrow and trial when we think of other family members and their, their sorrows and, and the loss. But there are precious words on a believer's lips. God is our refuge and help. 
a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. These are not glib words that we speak to the sky, hoping that the fates will answer. Dressed in faith, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to our God in heaven, he hears and he answers. But looking here at the context of this psalm, the psalmist says, it, says in the title were those people that worked in the temple, part of the clan or the tribe of the Levites that had their duty about the, the spiritual life of the people of Israel. And they were concerned about the pathway the nation took or fearfulness and in international developments. And they were concerned about the spiritual life of the individual, including their own. Being troubled by a world that seemed to be filled with chaos. Where for some religion and attending the temple was just a matter of form and tradition. For some, it was a matter where they rejected the God who'd revealed himself. How fearful it is to think of the God who is there and we would not respond to his love. You see, the context of the psalm describes something terrible happen. Perhaps the, the most unimaginable thing, the earth being removed, the mountains being carried into the midst of the sea, the idea of the floods overwhelming and, and blotting out everything in an earthquake. Basically, all those things that we trust in are destroyed. Where do we turn? What can we do, as the psalmist says in 111? What can man do when the foundations are destroyed? What do the righteous do, those who call upon the name of the Lord? Well, the psalm tells us, know that the Lord is in his holy temple. And that's the emphasis of the psalm and the hope that we have. We may not understand events or all that takes place, but God is the one who is there. And we must not take the government upon our own shoulders. It rests upon his shoulders there on the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can take the burden and the chaos of the world upon us. But God is the one who calls us to look to him and to lay that burden of care before him. The burden of guilt at the foot of the cross. The burden of care at the feet of our Savior and the burden of death at the rolled away stone from the empty tomb. We carry many burdens on our shoulders. We have care, we have duties, responsibility, and those things are right and proper as part of our life. But consider the call to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. His yoke is easy, his burden is light because he is there. He is the one who shares that with us as we come to him in faith. Sometimes we feel ourselves drifting from this hope. But surely in our own hearts and our own desire, are we not drawn by our very nature to believe in him? Perhaps we struggle in resisting God or resisting the nature of the one who is there. We, we know that we're, we're made with this desire for someone who is higher than us, someone who rules over all things, someone who brings order out of what seems disorder. Well, that is God calling to us. He is there and he shows us his son whom he sent to come in the flesh, to bear the burdens of this life and ultimately the burdens of sin even unto death, that we might come to God. We might be still and that we might know him. God is not a way out there. God is here with us. He has revealed himself to us. Well, what kind of God is he then? Is he unknowing? Is he uncaring? Is he unable? And in a sense, that's the, the question that is introduced by the psalmist. Look at the nature of the world. Well, there are so many things that do not affect us. Earthquakes and floods and other things. But death affects us. 
This matter is still before us. It's in our families. It's before us. And perhaps for some, it may be immediate in our minds. But what about death? Will we not treat it lightly? It is a serious and solemn matter. But the Bible tells us it's dealt with. It's dealt with through all that Christ has done. The Bible reveals God to us. He is an all-knowing, all-loving, all-powerful. The one who calls us to come. The one who says, seek me, I will be found. The one who says, draw near, I have drawn near to you. The psalmist indicates he is above and beyond the chaos of this world. Not in the manner that he is uninterested, but in the manner that he holds us through these things, he sustains us. Because it says in verse 4, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. A place where God's people dwell together in hope. It's not a spring, not a tiny drop. It is a river, a gushing river of peace. Will we ever say, see peace again? Yes, everyone here, I'm sure, has known bereavement in your life. But there is a point where things change. Life has changed. You adjust. You never get over these things. But where has your peace come from? Is it through putting it to the back of your mind? Carrying on and just being busy with matters? Or seeing that there is peace with God? There is a permanent, everlasting peace. There is peace. Peace, as it says, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. That is where it comes from. It comes from the God of grace, the God of mercy. And when we look at our trials that are real, our grief, our sorrow, our loss, our disappointments, our own sin and guilt, our own times when we have betrayed others, we've disappointed others. So many broken things in our life. Is there an answer? Will there ever be peace and a restoration? Well, it all begins with peace with God and reconciliation with God through his Son. Colossians 1 tells us about this. It tells us that there is peace through his Son who made peace through the blood of of the cross, a life shed instead of our life, a substitute in our place that we might come in faith to God, that we might know forgiveness, that we might know that the power of death no longer has that hold on us, our soul, or our flesh, and that we are reconciled to God our Father eternally. The world is filled with sin and sorrow and death, we know that. We just have to look at the news, hear the news of others, and we know there's sorrow and death visiting this family and others in our neighborhood and community. But God calls us to pause. The Lord of hosts is with us. This is who it is. The God of Jacob, the one who has been tested and proved in days past, we can test and we can prove that he will sustain us because there is an answer in the Lord Jesus. That call is for us to stop and to come aside. Yes, when we lose a loved one, life seems to stop, doesn't it? There's all the busyness of the arrangements. There's busyness of visitors. There's busyness of a day like this. And, and that is all good as we... We, we draw the warmth and the love from those who come and share their sympathies. But there will be sorrowful times, perhaps this evening, the coming days and the coming weeks. There will be sorrows that will grip our heart in so many ways, so many tears that are yet to be shed. But we be still, but not without hope. Not allowing fears to develop in our hearts to overwhelm us, but to stop from our striving and to look up. 
There is a warning here in this psalm that God says, look, he, he brings man's rebellion to nothing. But he brings man to be reconciled with him through the cross. That is the call that he has. He holds out the, his hands to us as scripture pictures him drawing and longing us to come to taste, to drink and to eat of the living bread and that life-giving water that sustains to eternity. God is with us. This is the God of the host of heaven. That heavenly host where not only the angels are proclaiming the greatness of God and also the greatness of that lamb. Worthy is the lamb who was slain, the Lord Jesus Christ. But all those in Christ who have gone before. In whom in Christ we are separated through the veil of death. We are still in the veil of tears. We still have sorrow. We still have striving to that point. But they are in that closer union. And in Christ we are yet in fellowship with them and we will be in full fellowship at the return of the Lord or our own death and whatever God decides. But we know that our sister Vera is the nearer presence of the Lord. We have that testimony. The testimony from our own lips but also from her own life and her witness. She is reconciled to God through her Savior and she knows him fully to be the loving and forgiving and reconciling God. This is the one who is God, who is upon the throne. Have no doubt about it. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Many years ago, we are sure that fear answered that call. Christ is exalted. Christ was exalted higher than all her sorrows in life, but was evident in her joy in the Lord. Verses of this psalm we read together on Saturday evening in the hospital. She was soon to meet her Savior. These words are precious. These words she repeated on her lips. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. These are precious words on the lips of a believer. These were precious on her lips as soon as she was to enter into glory. Are these words with confidence and faith upon our lips. Amen. Let us stand together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you're the one who is upon the throne. And we, through your scripture and the revelation through your Son, Know who you are. Lord, we know that as we embrace that revelation, we must look to you in faith. Look to you in hope. Look to you even when in life we do not understand events or it seems that our foundations are shaken or removed. That we know that our foundation is in something greater. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ and in his finished work. Because when our other foundations are removed, and so they shall be, we are certain that we will ever be with the Lord. Our hearts are filled with thanksgiving for the precious life of Vera. We know that she was one whose works were approved. They, her works were righteous. For the praise and glory of you, our God. And we know that she will leave a hole in our hearts and lives. As she will do in the life and witness of God's people in this place. But we do pray for your blessing and comfort on her home and family. That you would strengthen them. That they would draw encouragement from all who have come. 
but particularly know strength in the Lord. As our hearts are filled with thanksgiving, as they are burdened with sorrow, we lay all these things before you, knowing that you will take them up and that you will bring them to your praise and to your honor. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. Closing psalm that the family have chosen. It's very appropriate, Psalm 40. A testimony to faith. Again, the psalmist is not always certain events or what is happening or what is the reason. But as the scripture tells us so often, wait upon the Lord. At times, scripture tells us, be of good cheer, wait upon the Lord. God inclines his ear. And a lovely picture of a father inclining his ear or a mother inclining her ear to their child, ready to hear, ready to respond. And so it is as we call out to God. And what is this? This is the believer's prayer. And he took me from a fearful pit, a miry clay. We were sinking down because our foundations were not the rock of Christ. And so God set us upon that rock establishing our feet in that right pathway. And there is a new song. Our new song as, as a believer brings us in reflection to the new song of those in glory this day. Praising God without the, the weakness of the flesh or the troubles of heart and mind. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. And blessed are those who trust upon the Lord alone. We don't rest upon lies. We don't rest upon deception that tells us to trust in other things or ourselves or anything else. Trust in God. Your works are wonderful. Your works are filled with grace. Your thoughts are to us so much that you sent us your only son. When we pause and think, when we are still, who can reckon even the number of them? We sing as we stand Psalm 40. And then we remain standing for the benediction and as the family then leave the church. <clears throat>
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and always. Amen.